Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we're in Guthrie, Oklahoma, which might not be familiar to you, but it should be. It was actually the first capital of Oklahoma and was the place where the land rush started. Within about six hours, 10,000 people had moved to the Guthrie area. And now we're going to go in and find out why this territory museum is oh so important for Oklahoma history. Now, before we even move inside, there's some displays out here about the African-American experience in Oklahoma. And I thought that this was really cool because it tells you about how in certain sections, they actually designated it for people who were free to come here and start afresh. Many of the African-Americans would come here as cowboys or even as law enforcement. And I think that's a really cool testament to this area and how at the time it was brand new and they were trying new things and they were trying to do so in a more equal kind of way. So through this entire section right here, you can learn a little bit more about that experience. And uh, who is this? Who is this? Is this dad? This is dad. Hello. Dad's along with us on this adventure today and he actually discovered this first. So, so dad was just saying that all the ones that are in red here are still incorporated. The ones in black are not, but these were some of the original settlements of Oklahoma right here. And in this section we find out a little bit more about the schools and the population and how they were able to find success in farming. And then over here, something that I just learned that I didn't know about this area right here, they started out, all the schools were integrated. And it wasn't until several years later that they actually gave them the option to segregate. And so at first, everything in Oklahoma was very much so together. And then they started to branch off as more politics came into play. Now we're not gonna talk about politics this whole video. I just thought that was fascinating. There will be a few things that have to do with the land race also that are also political, but um, yeah, we're not gonna settle on that. We're just going to explore it for what it is and learn about Oklahoma history today. Okay, this is the start of the museum and we're going to wrap around and look at all of these displays. And then there is a second floor also. We are moving into the settlement of the Oklahoma Territory. Now, Oklahoma first came to the United States as a part of the Louisiana Purchase. And I've done a video showing you one of the quarter markers that is in Arkansas that's kind of cool to go and check out. But it says here, this massive purchase of land right here was the Louisiana Purchase. And at the time, whenever America acquired it, they didn't really need it, uh, but they went ahead and went forth with it because it was connected land. And in doing so, they opened up this entire section of land so that people could then go and inhabit it. And from there, of course, there were Native Americans and things like that. And so people were a little bit more hesitant to explore the unknowns because they didn't know what was out there. But that's whenever the next part began. The process of relocating the Native Americans began from the Northeast Territories, which were up toward the East Coast. And they started to funnel people down. This is what it might have looked like for one of those groups that were being removed to the Indian territories. Now they considered this area in the Louisiana Purchase a perfect place to go and kind of move the natives to because then they would be out of the way. But at a later time, they also decided they wanted to settle that land, which is where we get into even more of the controversy. First of all, they were moved there and then they were told they couldn't stay there as well. So it's a really big mess and it's not exactly the best way to treat one another. And as you know on the channel, I always say we need to treat each other better, but we also need to learn from the past so we can make a better tomorrow so we don't repeat those mistakes. So that's what this haul is going to help us do, learn about what has happened. And this is how they moved the Indians from one place to the next. As you can see, these different groups were coming in to different areas and Native Americans were considered to be in Oklahoma as their new home base. So you have people like the Osage and the Kickapoo, the Fox, the Chickasha, the Choctaw, the Waco, the Comanche, the Apache. And all these people didn't necessarily want to be cramped into one place and they didn't all actually get along. So on top of having to be relocated, they also had a lot of internal issues which would come from this in addition. And 
rightfully so. These people were spread out and had their way of life based on the climate that they lived in. And then suddenly they were thrust upon Oklahoma. After the Native Americans were relocated, they basically broke up the lands into certain tribal sections. And as you can see, this is a very truncated version of what actually happened. So they had tons of different tribes, but they only had five sections really that they put them in. And because of that, again, there were a lot of issues. They remained here for several years until the land rush. When the land rush began, some of these subsections were actually opened up for people to come and take whatever they wanted to make their claim. That was their piece of the world that they were gonna stake their claim to and it was gonna be where they lived. And people came from all around, not just in the United States pre-existing, but from other countries because they heard about this land rush. If you've ever seen the movie Far and Away, that's an example of what the land rush might have looked like. People came from other countries, they worked hard to put their money together, and then when the cannon went off, they would race to the property they wanted. But these properties were also the properties that the natives had been told were theirs. So you can see the problem here. Now inside the museum, we'll also find things like this. This is a really cool photo, and you can see the details in each person. There's the surveyor equipment up here. You have your marshal right in the front there. There's even a little dog in here. They have survey markers. Those are the long pieces. And then you can read the sign in the background. It actually says surveyor, government notes, and maps. And then inside the cases, you can see what those tools looked like a little bit better. This is actually a compass that belonged to one of the surveyors. Now, during the process of the land being settled and after the land was settled, trains became a big, huge thing, not only here in Guthrie, but across the whole state. And you had several different lines that would do short rides and then several that would do longer rides. So they would transport everything from people to goods and services, um, items that you might need in your stores, things like that. So this section talks about all of that and it's really cool. They have a cart back here that was really neat to see and then you can see some of the photos also of the actual trains that came through this area like this one right here this one actually shows soldiers that are guarding the trains in Oklahoma now let's set the stage it's 1889 and it is time for all the people who have poured into this area for the land rush to actually make their race it was at this point that you have this sign right here. This sign details the Dawes Act, which guaranteed each head of household receive 160 acres. Single individuals could receive 80 acres if they were under the age of 18. It says that manuals like these were actually available on border towns like in Kansas. These were guidebooks that would give you advice on how that you could create your own homestead. They had everything from the laws and rules to the tips on locating and describing your land and all the supplies that you might need. Dad is over here looking at this, which looks like an encampment. So let's go a little bit closer and find out what he is looking at. What is this, Dad? This is a Sears and Roebuck catalog. Oh, wow. It's 1897. It's not, it's not the original one, but it is one that you can order stuff from. I read right, it says you had you could order uh, 24,000 mail orders item. Wow. Uh, from the Montgomery Wards catalog. So this was serious, so it probably was pretty close to the same thing. Wow. Oh my goodness, is that? That's horse supplies there. Okay. Framed pictures. Mirrors. Mirrors. Oh wow. A little bit of everything in there. You buy a buggy through them. Clothes. So, so quite frankly, the Sears and Roebuck catalog was like Amazon of today. They had literally everything. Along this little rail here, there's some stories of the people that came here and settled the land. It has some of their direct quotes. And then inside this area, you'll find some of the things that they might have brought with them. And on one of these, it says that 
they would literally pack their things and then just kind of put their kids in between the things so that they could make sure they had enough to make it. Is that an apple peeler maybe? Down in front we have like a little crib and some clothes and then a trunk where they could put all of their possessions that they were traveling with and keep them out of the elements. In the back there's a little mirror and this is what one of the wagons might have looked like. You have a bed frame and everything that you would need in your home in that wagon. Now picture this for a moment. You are going to the land rush and you have to take everything that you have and put it into a wagon. What would you deem a necessity? What would you deem something that you could get later? Would you have that option to get it later? These are all questions that you should be asking when we're looking at this because that's the reality of what it was. People would literally have to take everything that they had just to make it to where they thought their future could be. And so that aspect of the land run is fascinating and also mind blowing. It would be very difficult to think that, that is how you're going to settle for the next however long for generations medicines, elixirs, books, dresses, dress forms, things to make clothes, curling irons, styling tools. Look here guys, this is entertainment. So this was like the modern day Viewmaster right here. I've seen several of these that you can actually touch and hold on to and look at some of the slides and how different they are when I've been to other museums. And this is what the photos would have looked like right there. In addition, in this case, we have an old baseball mitt, some checkers, a fiddle. Here is one of the points of entry maps right here. It shows that there were different trails that you could come in on to be a part of the different land rush. And right here is where we find Guthrie. So it's pretty close to the entry point right here and not too far from the northern point right here. Let's move into the land office. This is the rules for settlement. The Homestead Act of 1862 provided the main rules. So homesteaders must be 21. They can be younger than 21 if they're the head of the house. Single, widowed, separated, or divorced women were also eligible. Foreign citizens just had to show intent to become a U.S. citizen to make their claim. Homesteaders can only claim 160 acres or a town lot but they cannot do both, so you couldn't live in town and then also outside of town. They cannot already own 160 acres. Homesteaders must stay on the land five years and make improvements to get the final title to their land. Now that was a big one. Union veterans could deduct time spent in the Civil War from these five years, and homesteaders could get their title early by paying $1.25 an acre after the first year. Now, once people would stake their claim on their land, they had to go and register that land, and they did so at the land office. There were two people inside the land office for all of these claims in the Guthrie area, and they were working nonstop to file all the necessary forms and paperwork to make sure that everyone's land was legitimately their land and on paper as their land. And if you were thinking office like as in building, no, this is what the original land office looked like. And this is what the forms would have looked like right here. These are actual forms and copies of those form surveys. This guy and this guy right here, these were the guys from the land office. Now right here, this entire wall is about the Sooners. And if you've watched an OU football game before, you've heard them say Boomer Sooner, Boomer Sooner. And uh, Sooner actually is a name of a group of people who when they came to the land rush, wanted to get here early to stake their claim. And, uh, you know, th they didn't look too highly on that because you weren't supposed to cheat. So what would happen is they would pack super light, barely anything with them, and they would ride in under the cloak of night through the territory, usually through areas that weren't quite as safe. They'd get to the property and then they'd hide out and hunker down kind of. And then they would hope that they eluded the authorities because you weren't supposed to do that. But they wanted that stake of land so badly they were willing to risk it all to get there early so that they could call that piece their own. And uh, now we know them as the Sooners. Now it's time for us to go upstairs. 
In the stairwell, we have the grand seal of the territory of Oklahoma, and then a cup and drawing set from the Guthrie architect, Joseph Foucault. These are some of the lawman badges and knives of several different people who served in this area. And we are now to life in the Oklahoma Territory, which is a large upstairs gallery. This flag you might notice has a little something special right here. There is an embroidered star right in the corner. And this is the 46th star flag. This was presented to the state of Oklahoma by the city of Philadelphia on July 4th, 1908. And this gallery is a little bit darker, but the flag is illuminated. And as you can see, it is huge. Now, once people staked their claim on their land, then it was time to get to work. They had 160 acres or 80 acres, depending on their selection, but they had to cultivate it and improve it. In order for them to survive and thrive, they would have to grow crops on it. And that became a little bit more problematic than a lot of them were prepared to take on. Some of them did have expertise in farming. However, Oklahoma soil was a lot different and the climate changing so frequently was very much so a trial and tribulation kind of moment. Through this area, we find out more of those stories. It says after filing their claim, they had to begin to improve and shelter was the first method for doing so. A lot of shelters began as tents or lean-tos. They even used tarps in some situations, but then they started to use the dugout structures because they were a little bit more stable in keeping them out of the elements. Eventually, sod houses were the typical thing. And then they began to create more sticks and bricks kind of homes much later on. To service these homes, they needed water. If you didn't find a plot that had a stream or a lake beside it, you would have to hand dig your well. Now, hand digging your well was very time consuming and also very labor intensive. So just imagine hand digging anything to get to water. It's not just like right under the surface in most places, guys. Out of necessity, people began to plant crops. Cotton was a boom crop for a lot of homesteaders. And in 1897, over 15,000 bales were marketed to Guthrie alone. And by 1907, Guthrie had 18 cotton gins. Blacksmiths were key to having the success in the community. And so you would have several different blacksmiths for each particular area within the territory. And these blacksmiths would do everything from creating tools to also horseshoes. They would do just about everything that you could need when it comes to metal, including wheels for your wagon. Despite the difficult nature of life on the new territory, not everything was absolutely hard all the time. They did have entertainment and things like that. They had downtown areas which would offer goods and services that were easier to access. And places like Guthrie thrived. And one of the reasons why is because they did have this epicenter for everything. And so living in the Guthrie area, you could go to an opera house and see a show, or you could go to a restaurant style dine-in experience and enjoy yourself. Schools in the territory began to emerge, most of the time through borrowed labor from those who were going to have children in the school system. They were not much, just usually one room, but they offered an education to the kids so they could learn simple basic things that they could take with them into the world after only a few years. At the time, school wasn't like it was now. It was very, very different, but these territorial schools gave them a foundation for which they could go forward with. This right here is what one of the schools might have looked like. See, it's just like one room. It's not very big. It's absolutely not big enough to put more than just a few people in there, but they would cram them in as much as they possibly could. And as we talked about before, at the beginning, the schools were actually integrated. It wasn't until 1890 that they actually started to create segregation within the schools. This is an actual report card from 1904, and then a student's desk. The house that stands before us was actually occupied for approximately nine years. And it was occupied by a man named Edmund Jacobs. He was listed in the registry as a single man. Now he talked about things being small. This is only eight feet 
by 11 feet. And it was plenty of room for him to have everything he needed. He had his way to cook. He had his way to sleep. Restrooms at that time were not inside, so that wasn't even an issue. But inside is where we find just what it was like to live during those times. Looks like he had a sleeping loft, so you would go up these stairs to the sleeping loft. And then downstairs, he has a little table where he could eat or read or do anything that he needed to. He has a very small stove over here and an area for his items kind of on the wall. And yeah, it's dark in there because they didn't have traditional lights. They only had lamps. To combat some of that darkness during the day, he had windows. And so he could open up his curtains and allow a little bit of light to come in. But yeah, that's, that's about it. This area toward the rear of the museum actually is a ledger storage area. And these are the actual ledgers from this area throughout the years. They've made it accessible for us to see what they look like through this glass wall, but we can't access them. Remember how we said Guthrie was absolutely nothing before the land run? This is it only a few short years later. It became the epicenter for the cotton industry of Oklahoma. And you can see here how many people are in the streets. And then over on the side, you see the bales. They're like this bale right here of cotton. There actually were 18 separate cotton gins within Guthrie. Naturally, with that many people, you need to have some place for them to go and unwind. And so there were a lot of saloons, a lot of saloons. But something I didn't know until just this moment was that Carrie Nation, Carrie Nation, who we've seen at some other sites, actually lived in Guthrie for a little while. And her outlook on life was that you didn't need alcohol, you didn't need bars. And instead of approaching that from a peaceful standpoint, she took a hatchet and would just go in and randomly start hacking things up so it would mess up their business. So uh, she wasn't supported by a lot of people because of her actions. But she lived in Guthrie and uh, it was during this time when all these saloons were everywhere. Okay guys, so we came to this area that has like this little casket and this Oregon and obviously a, a black dress. And it is the recommended time for dress and family mourning section. I didn't know there was a protocol for this, but clearly there is. Wow, this is interesting. So it tells you your level of mourning and how long you should be doing it. A widow should mourn her husband for two and a half years. And there's steps to how she should mourn. A widower should only mourn for three months and there's only one step for him. A mother for a child, one year. A child for a parent in general, one year. A wife for the parents-in-law, two years. A wife for a sibling, six months. Grandparents, granddaughter for grandparents is six to nine months. But mothers for parents-in-law of married children should be six weeks and second wife for husband's first wife, three months. Wait a second, time out. Second wife for husband's first wife's parents, three months. Here we learn a little bit more about the law enforcement in the territory. And they have these bronze busts of some of the more predominant people of the area. A few badges and a few of the guns that might've been used. And then definitely a good read for what is in this case over here all of the people that are called the Three Guardsmen of Oklahoma. But the reason that they needed this law enforcement was because they had people like this, the Doolin Gang and Tulsa Jack. Wow, okay. Uh, the Battle of the Ingalls and then the Guthrie Federal Jail. So all of this factors into those law enforcement officers. But let's not forget Miss Bellstar herself. We've seen several different places where she's been a problem. And then right here, Cattle Annie and Little Breaches. I haven't seen anything else about this one, but that's interesting. They earned their fame during their teenage years. Into the jail we go, and looks like somebody's locked up. Who are you? This is the actual Marshall record from 1889 to 1900, and it was packed. There was a lot of stuff going on. It says the most common violations were fist fighting, drunkenness, lot jumping, gambling, illegal wood cutting, prostitution, and running body houses. So 
so dad was just at this and he was watching it and then he directed me to this sign right here and this sign is so fascinating this is crazy facts so early movies like the one that's on the screen right here movie makers used to use paroled outlaws such as Emmett Dalton and Al Jennings for their characters in their earliest of movies that is insane so there's two different movies that play here the first one is the dalton raid on coffeeville kansas and it actually is starring emmett dalton and then there's another one called the bank robbery with al jennings playing in it there's even more interesting information in these little journals right here and this right here takes us to this right here which has a crazy story also now if you've ever ever heard of the six million dollar man show there is a episode called the carnival of spies now i've heard about this before but i didn't know that it would link to guthrie oklahoma today now what happened in the show was they actually were grabbing down what they thought was a mummy and it turns out that it was a real arm now this was <laughs> kind of a crazy discovery. It was discovered in the fun house and they were able to do DNA and pull information and find out that it was actually linked to right here in the territorial area. It happened in 1976 and the identity made national news. It says right here that they actually returned the mummy to Oklahoma for burial after discovering that it was outlaw Elmer McCurdy. And if you wanna find out a little bit more about McCurdy and just how he ended up there, definitely come to the Territorial Museum and read this. Now this section of the museum is about the road to statehood itself and just what it took to get there and to earn that star on that flag. So each display has a little bit of information. There is a lot of reading through this section, so I definitely recommend you come and take the time with each one of them. But let me show you a few of the highlights. Now, at the time of Oklahoma wanting to become a state, Congress regarded the traditional Indian communal ownership of the land as a major obstacle toward traditional statehood. Congress insisted that the Indian territory must be altered to conform to the American tribes. Now, by doing so, they wanted to form the five civilized tribes and they wanted to basically condense the Native American presence in the area. This, of course, proved problematic, and the Native Americans were not on board for this. However, like the government does, it pushed through its thoughts in order to move forward towards statehood. Things like this became commonplace. Signed into law on June 16, 1906, the Enabling Act did more than just join Indians and Oklahoma territories into a single state. It also set guidelines for achieving Oklahoma statehood. And in doing so, it broadcasted the differences between the territory and the statehood. This is one of the election pins that actually existed pushing for statehood in Oklahoma. And like with all things, in order to be a state, you need representation. So they began to start elections and created a platform for Democrats and Republicans to run in the state with backers financially. Now at the time of this happening, Oklahoma was a democratic state. The election proved that Democrats would sit in those seats and Republicans were kind of forced out. We know in more present day Oklahoma that it does trend more into a Republican state, but it began as a democratic state. Another interesting photo, this was actually some of the people of Oklahoma that were lawmakers. Look at this group right here. Now, throughout this area where we talk about the Constitution, there are several different artifacts like this, which includes a copy of the original Oklahoma Constitution that was printed by the Guthrie Daily Leader. And then we get to this section. This is where they actually voted to change the capital from Guthrie, where it had been, to Oklahoma City. And the reason that they chose to do this was stated that it was a larger economic impact area because of the direction that the trains would come to and the industries that were popping up there. 
Now you might be asking yourself the same question that I did. Why did they change the flag and when? And to answer that, See all of this, all of this red right here? This actually became problematic. And it happened because of something called the Red Scare that happened at the early 1900s. People were afraid that displaying this much red would actually trigger people into this fear. And so they opted to change the flag. So the Red Scare changed this red flag in the early 1900s to a Oklahoma flag that we're more familiar with today. Okay guys, that was the Oklahoma Territorial Museum here in Guthrie, Oklahoma. I hope you have enjoyed coming with me and having this historic day in Oklahoma. We learned so much. We learned about Oklahoma as a state. We learned about Guthrie as a place. We learned about the land rush. We learned about the Trail of Tears. And today, I feel as though we have a little bit better understanding of the state of Oklahoma. If you've enjoyed today's video, make sure that you do hit a like, subscribe if you're interested in future content, and remember, I do upload every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Till next time, guys.